Good morning and welcome to the uh, C1 session on special needs housing. Uh, this is on the Department of Community Services special needs housing program. Uh, with me today, uh, leading our department is Pamela A. Witty Oakland. Uh, she's the director of uh, City and County of Honolulu's Department of Community Services. The department administers 114 million of federal, state, and county appropriations, which provides housing and community development, senior and homeless supportive care, and workforce development to Oahu's at-risk population. Ms. Witty Oakland previously served as Vice President of Asset Management of St. Francis Healthcare System and led the Franciscan vision for development of a senior rental community financed with low-income housing tax credits and administered an outpatient surgery center. I got you. Thank you, Daryl, and good morning to everyone. Um, I'm going to tell you that during this COVID period, I've sat on, on your side of the table many a times listening to um, presentations, not realizing how challenging it is to be here and not be in the same room with folks. Um, I, I tend to walk around a room when I speak and find faces I know and pick questions, you know, pick on you folks for questions. So you're safe today. I won't call you out. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit today about the City and County of Honolulu Department of Community Services Special Needs Housing Portfolio. We've realized that many folks don't realize we own these 63 properties that we make available to nonprofit agencies for their residential programs. Before I get to the Special Needs Housing Portfolio, I'd like to give you a little bit of context about our department the things that we do for the community and ways that we can partner with you as agencies, policy and, and leaders in our community. So first of all, we have our elderly affairs division, our okay. office of grants management. You're all sharing, okay. Our workforce development division known as Work Hawaii, our community assistance division and our community-based division. And we all serve with a very common mission and that is we serve as community partners working to create to improve the quality of life for folks of Oahu. Okay, you're catching up with me. I'm two slides ahead of you. Sorry, we're just getting in sync here. There we go. Community partner creating opportunities to improve the quality of life for folks of Oahu. And so everything we do is within that thread of working with you as community agent as private agencies and using federal dollars to create those partnerships. And so I just identified the five um, divisions that we have and the special needs housing that we're going to talk about is within our community based development division. So if you just indulge with me a few minutes, we're not going to take a lot of time on this, but I want to talk about a little bit about what each division in our department um, provides to the community and then we'll get into our special needs housing. So elderly affairs. You know, they're actually recognized by the federal government as an area agency on aging. It's a 1964 Old Americans Act that was created years and years ago to support our homebound seniors. And we don't provide the services directly. We actually work with providers to do, to offer these services to our seniors in their homes. And for example, we do home delivered meals, personal care. This can include bathing for those who are really bed bound housekeeping, light housekeeping, um, and transportation services to those important appointments. The only criteria is you cannot be, um, you cannot have insurance that already provides these services. And the way to get into the program is just to call our call center at 768-7700. And if you look at the bottom, the last bullet, you can click on that link and that's a portal directly to our services and our handbook that has an array of services that we provide as well as providers who deliver those services. It's a guide for emergency planning. It has a, a form and a template to fill out, put on the refrigerator for first responders. So it's really a living document that provides resources as well as a tool for families who have either homebound seniors or if you're in a care, caregiver role um, as well as being taken care of. We also provide congregate dining in senior housing properties. Um, so that's or, for instance, Lanakila Senior Center. So senior centers or senior housing, we can provide congregate meals. 
albeit COVID has impacted everything you do and we do, our congregate dining is on pause right now, but we hope to, to bring that back to the table soon. Our next division is the actual, it's an office, Office of Grants Management. And here's where I would ask you to show or raise your hands to see how many of you have actually applied for the Grants and Aid Program. Um, if you have not, the deadline to submit is this Monday, November 23rd at 2 p.m. So if you haven't yet visited honolulu.gov forward slash DCS and go to our Office of Grants Management, it's still not too late. Um, the good news is Council just adopted a resolution last month to increase the limit. It used to be $125,000 per agency. It's, it's been increased to 200,000. So those are some of the new changes. But remember that deadline is Monday. If you haven't already applied, it's not too late. Um, enterprise zones you see on there, it's something else that our Office of Grants Management oversees. And if you're not familiar with it, there's a link on the, on the page as well to get more information. But it's zones set aside for businesses to get tax breaks both on Hawaii income tax as well as general excise tax. Um, it's an area, a census tract actually, that has to have at least 10,000 individuals residing there. 25% of the households have to be less than 80% of area median income, or roughly $80,000 for a tax family of four on a normal basis. And the unemployment rate has to be 1.5 times the state average. So if you meet all three of those criteria, then that particular census tract becomes part of an enterprise zone and businesses in that area are able to have lots of tax incentives to be able to do startups or expansions. You're saying the baby women are unemployed. Okay, I've been advised I need to speak up and use my, my deeper voice a little bit more consistently. Thank you for the tip. Um, the last thing Office of Grants Management does is child care development. We don't actually run the programs, but we provide the land for providers to develop facilities upon. Okay, Daryl, the next one. And as we're going through these, you know, you have the chat box if you want to submit some questions. Our staff will be monitoring these questions and we'll circle back and, and help you with answers a little bit later on. Okay, our next division is our Work Hawaii Division. And obviously in this time of a pandemic and so many layoffs that we have, workforce development has become very much in demand. As an agency, we're funded by the Federal Department of Labor, and we provide both employee training and employer recruitment services. For instance, when um, Southwest Airlines moved to Honolulu or Honolulu Airport, we helped do the, um, coordinate the job fairs for their training for their staff that are stationed here in Honolulu. So everything they do is workforce development, including assisting families experiencing homelessness, rental assistance while they engage in some job training to improve their earning power. They've also put together an outreach team to address unemployment during this impact, um, time of impacting by COVID-19. Okay. Our next division is our Community Assistance Division. Many of you probably know of it as our Section 8 Division. We've been trying to rebrand that to Housing Choice Voucher Program, which is what HUD has renamed it. I know many years ago they renamed it, and we all still call it the Section 8 Housing Program. But it's, it gives the households the choice to take that federal assistance and find the home that they want to choose to live in, home or apartment. So it really is the resident's choice. Um, they offer a family self-sufficiency program for those participating in the Housing Choice Voucher Program. And this allows you to set some life goals and instead of paying that incremental increase in rent that the Section 8 program requires as your earning earning earnings increase, you take that incremental increase and set it aside in an escrow account. And if you fulfill those five-year goals, you collect that escrow savings toward a family goal, whether it's paying for school, a new car, or maybe even a down payment for housing. Okay, our next, well, let me make uh, one reminder there. Our Housing Choice Voucher Program just public, uh, published a public notice. We are updating the admin rules also to include our project-based voucher program. So look for that in the, the newspaper. Um, lastly, our last division is Community-Based Development Division. That has two branches. It's one of our most, 
call it um, exciting as well as complicated uh, divisions because of the abundance of federal programs and the federal regulations that guide the work we do there. But it is one of the most rewarding uh, works that I've ever participated in. So the program branch is funds, outreach, shelters, housing first, and hopefully you saw in the news on Tuesday, Daryl, Tuesday, two days ago, we blessed our Punavai building in Ivale. It's a multi-level building that provides a hygiene center on the ground floor. It will provide 21 units of permanent supportive housing. And early next year, well, they'll start construction early next year for a clinic. All of these are targeted for persons experiencing homelessness. So we look forward to the results of seeing that construction done and, and the rest moving forward on those programs. Okay, I want to press my lungs, sorry. Um, housing first, I mentioned housing first, and I'm just going to share one data point there. And we just got the evaluation of our fifth year of housing first program. And we have experienced 92% of the clients moving through Housing First program not returning to homelessness. So we're really proud and excited about those outcomes. Next slide. The um, other branch of the Community-Based Development Division is the Construction or Housing Branch. And this is where our special needs housing portfolio lies. This is where we get a lot of federal funding as well as city funding for construction, acquisition, and rehabilitation of housing as well as we serve as the Fair Housing Office for the City and County of Honolulu, or the island of Oahu. So we've gotten to our destination now. It only took me about eight minutes to get you to the meat of the program. So let's talk more about our special needs housing program. So, and, and today's purpose is to get you folks to think about what your needs are for your programs, your organizations, your mission, and if there's a residential component that you're found, you have found that's missing or you need some support to further subsidize, this is the opportunity. This is what we provide. So the types of uses that are eligible is elderly, disabled, homelessness, transitional housing, domestic violence, and survivors of domestic violence, and developmentally disabled as well as physically disabled individuals and persons experiencing mental illness. So we provide these residential units, the majority of single family homes, there are a couple of shelters, um, specifically for domestic violence survivors, um, but most are single family homes, limited to five unrelated individuals, but all of these types of uses are eligible for the use of these homes. Darryl. As I mentioned, we have 63 properties, and if you do nothing else but Print out this slide, memorize this slide, and note that this is the meat of the whole presentation. We're going to talk about, we just identified the eligible uses. We're going to talk about what it takes to participate in this program, what the criteria looks like, and we'll show you a little bit more about how you can use these properties. So of the 63 properties, 14 of them are just ground leases. And this is where our department owns the land. We own it in fee. And we've made it available to private agencies to develop affordable housing. Examples of that include um, Kailua Elderly, Punavai, I'm sorry, not Punavai, um, Pauahi Kapuna, Jack Hall in Waipahu, and Ever Elderly. So those are just examples of the city provides a dollar a year ground lease. And that's their dollar a year because that's what they were 25 years ago when we did them. The leases are about 75 year leases. And it allows the developers to we fully subsidize the cost of the land. And they go out and find funding for the construction of the infrastructure. And then they just manage it on their own. The other 49 housing units, like I mentioned, two are shelters, emergency shelters. So at least 47 single family homes that are used by agencies such as Easter Seals. Um, they have an adult disabled, I'm sorry, developmentally disabled adult day program in one of the houses that was part of the old Eva Villages plantation. That's just one example of a type of a use. So now the question is, how do you get to participate or become a lessee for one of these properties? So the first thing we do is we actually have to, by um, state law, do a procurement. So we've got to publish a procurement through our purchasing department. 
and I believe we have a couple scheduled to go out in the next two to four weeks. So if you're not registered with our city and county, it's city and county Honolulu, Department of Budget and Physical Services Purchasing Division, please go to the Purchasing Division website, register, and you'll get email notices when procurements are put up on the website. So all of these properties are published and advertised through the Purchasing Department. And then you've got to submit proposals, they get reviewed internally, and you get selected. And that's the hardest part. Actually, it's not. It's not a hard process at all. But it needs to be mission-driven, and it needs to meet CDBG and HUD, CDBG, I'm sorry, let me get rid of my acronyms, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Community-Based, I'm sorry, Community Development Block Grant, and Home Investment Partnership. Those are the two HUD programs that were used, those funds were used to acquire these properties. And so the city and HUD require that they continue to be operated in CDBG and home eligible uses and meet the national objectives. So again, if I was in the room with all of you, I'd ask you to raise your hands, tell me how many of you know what I'm talking about in terms of HUD requirements, and if you have or haven't used HUD finance properties um, I'd spend a lot more time going through the weeds, but at this point, I'm going to ask you to call me. My phone number is in the first slide, the last slide, 768-7760. If you're interested, our team will sit down with you folks, talk you through it. If you've not used these resources before, please let us know. We're happy to provide technical assistance and support your agency in becoming familiar with how to take advantage of these resources. I have one question. Go ahead. Okay. We have not done that before, to be honest. Um, so we can look into that. The whole, whole facility has to be used to meet the national objective. So the question is, a single family home for a parent with a disabled child, whether we could, if we could do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I'm honestly going to ask that you put in your contact information and we will research that and get back to you. That is not a use that we have utilized here yet. And I'm not sure that the answer is yes or no. So let us do some research and get back to you on that. But thank you for the question. Appreciate it. So once we go back to the process, once we've gone through the procurement process and selected a provider, we have to take it to the city council with a resolution and seek the council approval. And that's standard protocol for leasing of city property. Now the lease term will be limited to five years unless the organization um, invests 25,000 or more into the property. So city will acquire, city will have own land and the building in fee simple. We offer a lease arrangement to the organization. Now, if you have special needs for the house that need to be adapted maybe for someone it may not be ada compliant so you need to put some improvements in to make the entire facility ada compliant so if your organization is investing twenty five thousand or more then we can talk about maybe a 10 or 15 or longer lease term it's going to be proportionate to the investment that's being made by the organization so obviously the more investment you're putting in the longer the lease term and as i mentioned with the ground leases. Those organizations that come in and take the ground and fund and build the entire housing project, we give them a 75 year term. So we'll talk about the investment in proportion to the lease term. And we also talked about earlier, the limitation on how the res residential units are used. And if you're keeping it limited to five or less unrelated individuals in a residential setting, it's absolutely permitted. So unless you are needing to have more than five unrelated individuals, you're fine. If it's more than five, you have to go into our Department of Planning and Permitting to apply for a conditional use permit. Okay, that also requires a public hearing within the community. So there's additional steps that you have to take if you want to use it for a larger type program, but for anything five or less, you're fine with using it in a residentially zoned environment. Brown, did you have another question? No. Nope. Okay. Okay. Thank you for sending your contact information. 
A couple of other things I want to talk about in terms of the leasing. And this is all slide 11 is, like I said, the most important piece. Um, when applying for one of these properties in your application, keep your purpose broad or as, as broad as your mission allows. We have all been in this industry for a long time. We know that funding changes. Um, it can be at the federal level. It can be at the state level. It could be even at the city level. And once your funding changes, your criteria or your scope may have to change as well. So if you narrow your scope way too much, then your funding changes, then you you cannot meet the terms of your lease because we put the specific programmatic goals within the lease. So keep your purpose broad. Make sure you meet the HUD objectives that are requirements for the community development block grant or the home program. Um, you can find the details of that in 24 CFR 570 for CVBG and 24 CFR 92 for home. So long as it's within that criteria and consistent with your mission, take it broad so that if your funding morphs a little bit or changes over time, that you'll still be able to keep yourself in that uh, property without being in violation of your lease. The other um, point that I really want to make about the responsibilities of the lessee, now, the city will be responsible for structural or exterior type improvements. Over time, a house is going to need a new roof. We'll take care of that. Um, over time, you may have some of the older buildings termite um, damage or infestations to deal with. We'll deal with that. That's structural. Exterior painting, again, that's city responsibility. The ask the city makes of the nonprofits or the organizations are to maintain the properties in good working order. And so all repair and maintenance is the responsibility of the agency. The lease rents are only $100 a month, and your real property taxes are only $300 a year. So with that nominal rent and nominal taxes, the only expectation we have is that everything on the interior is in good working order. So we don't come in and change cabinets or countertops or flooring or fix plumbing. Those are yours. If you were living in a leasehold house yourself, you'd be responsible for taking care of the entire home. What we share with you, though, is the exterior components and any structural um, issues that arise. Um, I think, and I want, again, I want to emphasize, this is an opportunity for you folks to reach out to us. Um, we're going to show you in the next couple slides some of the organizations that we work with, some of the current uses that we have. But if you have a need that's being unmet, we're going to say it many times before we finish, we want to hear from you. We want to sit down. We have the time. We'll sit down with your team. Our staff here are very familiar with the programs and the, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development regulations. We want you folks to be able to take care, take advantage of these resources. Daryl. So you might wonder where are all of these properties, and we have how many coming up for publication? We have six that are coming up um, for procurement. Okay, so four of them are actually renewals of ex with existing providers in it, and, but there are two properties that are not are totally new. They're new acquisitions for the city, so they're totally new. Um, so let's talk about where they are. Let me just show you. Instead of talking about it, let me just show you. Our next slide is a map. And I'm assuming that, next slide, Daryl. I'm assuming that you're all sitting here and you can zoom in on this because I know it's, it's maybe a little bit tight on reading. But if you see the little aqua colored I don't know, pegs with the little white squares in it, those represent every one of our properties around Oahu. So I'm going to start up at the top. We've got Haula, Kuhuku, Haleiwa, Wahiwa, Waianae, Maili, Eva Beach, Waipahu, Pearl City, Aiea, all the way around to urban Honolulu, around to Hawaii Kai, Kailua, and Kaneohe. So we've tried to reach out to all of the communities on Oahu. If you've got a, an audience or a, or a population that you need to serve in some place that's not on this map, please, again, let us know. We receive funding annually. We can do new acquisitions. We'll show you some pictures soon on some of the recent acquisitions we've done. And this is our, our mission is to help you. Our mission is to find out what it is that you need 
and use the resources that we receive to meet that need. So we'll start now by sharing a couple of photos of some of the um, properties. Does anybody recognize this one? It's in um, Waikiki. Actually, my landmark is it's next to the original eggs and things. We used to all go for breakfast years and years ago. Um, right next door to that, it's about 31 units. It's designed for, we bought it in 2018, and we target it for persons experiencing homelessness. So the rents are at a 30% AMI level, and the ground floor is, is parking. Second floor is program space, and we're just getting ready to activate that, and all the upper units are residential. There's single room occupancy, so each unit has a bath, and they may have a microwave or a mini fridge in their unit, but there's a common area that's got a common kitchen that they all share on each floor. Okay. Next one, Daryl. This is one we most recently purchased it's in Haula. Um, we're proud to admit that we bought an illegal vacation rental and took it off the market. Um, there are three separate units here, each one um, five bedrooms, so a total of 15 units. And this is one of the ones that will be advertised shortly through the purchasing department, through the purchasing division of Budget and Fiscal Services Department. And um, think about how you can use it. They're, they're not ADA compliant, but they do have, each one of them has, I believe, at least two bedrooms on the ground floor. And the rest of the bedrooms are on the upper floor. So if you do need some ADA, or at least accessibility, ground floor accessibility, they do have bedrooms on the ground floor as well as upstairs. And once the um, procurement is posted, we will arrange for a site visit. You'll get to come out and actually see the property and have a better idea of how you could use it. So you'll get to see it before you actually submit your final proposal. So let's talk a little bit more. Let's go back to the kind of programs and our partners that we're looking for. And again, we talk about group homes, residential programs, um, no, go back to number six, slide, slide number 16, please. Um, we just tried to provide you with a little bit of language on the next two slides about who can be an operator. You know, if you're going to take on one of these group homes or residential units, you need to have a, some experience in managing housing. Um, you're not required to have a broker's license by any mean. You're not going to be leasing to individuals. In fact, you for the most part, the group homes you cannot. Um, but you need to understand how to take care of the asset and how to do a little bit of residential property management. But the use must be providing health and social services for those with either social problems or physical or mental disabilities. We kind of went through the list, but I just wanted to reemphasize it's a pretty broad perspective of what we can use the, um, the housing for. And the next slide, this is for the residential units. The next slide talks more about shelters. It's more of a facility that you would be running. Next one, Daryl, number 17. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a real subtle difference between the previous slide, but this is where you're managing facility. So this would be a homeless shelter or a transitional shelter or a survivors of domestic violence shelter, one of those types where you're doing more of a group setting. It's not a single family home. It's more of a facility. And it takes a little bit more to manage something like that. And again, if you've not done it, please let us know. We have the team, we have the folks available to sit down and walk you through that. Okay. Have questions? Okay. So the next thing we'd like to share with you is um, some of our existing partners, because one of the things that we've really been promoting is a collaborative approach. Some of the organizations that we, we work with are small, and it, for them to take on a building on their own or a couple of buildings, because like we just saw in Haula, you've got three distinct single family homes, multi-levels and multi-units. We're, we're really promoting collaboration. Because some organizations may have the strength in one area that the other ones don't, and synergy, always one plus one is three. We've all experienced that in our, um, our lifetime. 
So these are a list in the next slide as well. So we got Arc Hawaii. Arc Hawaii has been one of our partners from the very, very beginning. Um, and they have quite a few properties that they use for developmentally disabled individuals. Um, Alternative Solutions, Inc., ASI, Alea Bridge. Most of you folks recognize all of these organizations. And the next slide, Daryl, continues. These are all existing partners who have either a lease or a program at least managed inside of some of our special needs housing. And what I really want to get to is the next one where we talk about the collaboration. Yeah. So this next project I want to share with you is our Kauhali in Haleiwa. And it's, they label themselves the, the youth collection, collective, I'm sorry, youth collective. And this is Alternative Structures, Alea Bridge, and RISE. And so the three of them created a hui in order to be able to have the bandwidth to take on this, this particular property because it, it's consisting of three separate buildings. These were all former um, Haleiwa plantation housing. That's correct. Directly across the street from Haleiwa Elementary School. And so just the synergy and the collaboration allows them to be able to take on um, a bigger project, a bigger scale, and get realize economies of scale. The only requirement is to have a common mission. So in this case, one of the partners is addressing homelessness in a family for families. Another one, RISE especially, focuses on the youth. And so by partnering together, this particular building is for families who've been experiencing homelessness. And the next slide will show you the one in the upper right hand corner is for youth who've been experiencing homelessness. The shiny yellow car is a work in progress still. We've got some um, renovations that need to be finished before that one's move-in ready. Um, minor stuff, but it's almost done. And so just wanted you to understand that if you're looking at the, the applications and the proposals and the regulations and the how do I manage this, talk to your partners in the industry. Find out what resources they can bring to the table that may complement what you're doing. And, you know, one of the... The concept of collaboration um, during this pandemic is something we've all had to work with. And one that we as a department are particularly proud of is that we've been partnering with the State Department of Health to provide temporary quarantine and isolation centers for persons experiencing homelessness or any vulnerable population. I always go to homelessness first, but it's really for any vulnerable population that otherwise lacks appropriate home setting to isolate or quarantine from other family members. Let's say you live in a household rather large with only maybe one bathroom. So obviously you need an alternative place to go to keep the rest of your family um, safe. So we've been partnering with DOH. The city's been providing the residents, the residential setting, and DOH comes in. And some of you on this list are um, already partners with DOH to come in and provide the services. So the same thing happens here. See if you can partner with someone in the industry that between the two of you, your collaboration allows you to take on maybe a bigger property than you would otherwise do on your own. So the next one, Daryl. Um, this is another property. Actually, the same three organizations are partnered in this property as well. And this is Kauhali and um, Kewalo. And this one is was actually an older building in an older neighborhood and was a victim of a fire. And so the owners rebuilt it. So it was actually new construction at the time that we leased it to the organizations. And um, again, it's a collaborative, collaborative effort. And this one is experience for households experiencing homelessness. It's not necessarily restricted to youth or family, but they're rented out as SROs. And when we also, when we're doing our evaluation and proposals, we actually give extra points for those collaborations, okay? So know that there's added value by, by working together in a partnership program. So when you look at this unit, there's, it's divided left and right when you're looking at it, and there's six bedrooms in each, but because of the requirement for the zoning, we've restricted it to five bedrooms on each side of unrelated individuals, and that last bedroom is being used as a case management office. So that allows you to have some programmatic space in the building as well as a residential model. Okay, but again, extra points for collaboration. So remember that when you're filling out your application. This is the interior of the same property. So you can see how it was all brand spanking new. 
when we leased it out. Okay. And the last thing we want to just talk about is a little bit broader of some of the other programs that are not necessarily programs, but partners. This may provide some of you with an opportunity to do some collaboration. So the next slide identifies many of our program partners. And I'm going to apologize in advance if uh, anybody is left off this list. Uh, we were trying to be sure we provided opportunities for you to collaborate, but this is by no means an exhaustive list of all of the partners that we work with. But DVAC is um, one that we've partnered with for a long time. Family Promise, Gregory House, H3RC, IHS, all of you recognize most of these agencies have been around for a long, long time. Um, and we fund them for some of their programs. Now this list consists of organizations that develop affordable housing. So that's where we lease them the land and then they take the lease and then develop the affordable housing on top of that. So these are organizations who have lots of experience in managing properties and running real estate. So look at those as potential partners that you could work with and figure out how you can add that collaborative effort to your applications for additional points. Any questions? Well, Daryl's spoke. So. No, that's fine. So at, at this point, it, it brings us to a conclusion. I wanted to just share this word doodle that kind of puts together all of what we try to do here at DCS. And you know, obviously community is, is the big word. Everything we do evolves around our community. We appreciate all of you for being partners in helping us to deliver. We, we're the funder, you guys actually do the hardest part, and that is delivering the services on a day-to-day -day basis to people in need. Um, at this point, we can open it up for questions. If anybody wants to, I think you can raise your hand. Daryl will recognize you, and we can take verbal questions if, if you want. We have enough time to do that. Uh, let's see, we have a chat that says, I'm a nonprofit that's renting a house. Will DCS purchase for me and rent back? Good question. So we use the federal dollars to do the acquisition. So there's a, a huge list of prerequisites that we have to follow. One depends first on location and where the property is located. Um, we've, we've not, to my knowledge, not done an acquisition and done a, a lease back. Mostly because one, it depends on where the house is located. It can't be in a floodplain. Um, two, it de depends on when it was built. If there's any hazardous material that was built before 1970s, we have to go in and remediate any of the haz hazardous material. Um, three, there's relocations, that, that's uh, benefits that get triggered. We would actually have to pay to relocate you in order to go in and do any kind of remediations. So it's not really the most ideal um, setting. Usually we look for things that are va vacant. We look for units that are built after 1972 and we look for things that are not on the coastline. Um, you saw the building we bought in Waikiki on Anna Road. It was nine stories. Um, it was far enough inland that it wasn't in the flood plain that White, most of Waikiki is in. But thank you, Ken. Good question. How much savings can a person or family more than one accumulate in total? Okay, so Ken, your question is about the Section 8 program. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Hi, go ahead. Hi, Pam. Uh, yeah, I had two questions. One was about the Section 8 program choice. Uh, you know, I, I'm, it's in my head. It's still called Section 8. Um, the uh, how much can they actually accumulate while they're still living in there in terms of savings or anything like that? And the other question is, could you just uh, say again the CFR and the uh, I believe it was the HRS regarding the parameters to where the housing, you know, where, where those people need to be to kind of stay within bounds? Okay, the CFR, the CDPG, is 24 CFR 570. And the CFR for the home program is 24 CFR 92. Okay, and in each of those are subsections, and the most important ones to go look at is what are the eligible uses, and I think that's 201. The eligible uses, we'll look at the national objective period and what the requirements are to sustain, to how long you have to keep it in that use. Okay, 
And as for the uh, the question on the section eight, um, is the type of the total savings? Right. I'm going to double check, but to my knowledge, and I've been doing this for a few years now, I'm not aware of a cap. Um, the family self sufficiency program. And I'm going to tell you a quick story. We have a, a mother, a single mother, family of four four children who went through a divorce, didn't plan to be a single mom, um, was going to college, and she got on Section 8 and joined the program, and her goal was to finish school. And so she's, all of her additional rents she set aside, she was able to use that money to pay off her school loans. Um, and she's now the head of a special ed department at Kailua L, um, Intermediate School. So to my knowledge, there's not a cap, but I will verify that and speak to an email later today. All right, thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Chat, see if there's anything else. Okay. Um, if there are not any other questions, we want to certainly thank you for taking the time to participate. Remember that we're available at your pleasure to you know help further educate you on the process. And this last slide again has the main number to the Department of Community Services, 768-7760. We look forward to talking to you. Thanks for taking the time. And I'm seeing the red dot pop up. Is there one more? No, I think we already got it. We're good. Okay, folks, thank you very, very much. Stay safe and have a great day.